Hello, my dear students, and welcome back to Victory Batch. And I am your Diksha Ma'am. So here we are going to start with the another chapter from class eleven, that is excretory products and its elimination. I hope you all have finished your chapter body fluids and circulation. So it's time to buckle up and start our next chapter. Again, very important from need point of view, and that's excretory product and its elimination. So first of all, what we are going to talk about in this chapter. your excretory system and what's the difference between excretion and ejection so you must have come across these two words guys one is ejection that we have done in the digestive system and another word is excretion so whenever you eat food and that food does not get digested it will come out from your body in the form of feces you call it as ejection so in ejection the food or the undigested food is removed the undigested food is removed from gut from gut as feces all right now what about excretion in excretion for example you have had food and uh, some of the food get uh, gets digested and some gets undigested the undigested will be removed in the form of feces whereas the digested food will be absorbed into your blood vessel from blood vessel then it will go to your various tissues in the tissues when the food has been used now the cells will produce certain excretory substances so removal of those excretory substances which are usually nitrogenous you call that as excretion so excretion is the removal of metabolic waste it's the removal of metabolic waste after metabolism what waste is formed is your uh, your metabolic waste and its removal is excretion like your urea like your uric acid its removal is known as excretion that's a basic difference fine now let's get started with what are the various types of excretory waste so we make all the three types of excretory waste but one waste is your uh, the waste which is produced in the major or the large amount so that will be your main excretory waste fine for example if i talk about humans we also produce ammonia we also produce urea we also produce uric acid but what is your main excretory waste that means in what form it is moving out from your body and also it is produced in the large quantity so that will be urea right so like in different types of organism depending upon where they live and how their body is made up of they have their main excretory waste for example if i talk about ammonia you will find ammonia in usually aquatic organism because ammonia is very toxic and it needs more water for elimination right whereas urea is found in the terrestrial organism uric acid is also found in the terrestrial but the only difference is that uric acid is found in all those organism which cannot afford to lose a lot of water both are terrestrial both cannot afford to lose water but out of these two like for example if i say reptiles most of the desert reptiles they cannot afford their uh, you know a lot of water to be removed so for that uric acid is a waste anyways let's discuss about them in more detail so we'll start with the ammonia so ammonia is usually nh3 you all have heard of it in the chemistry right if i talk about ammonium ions that will be nh4 positive so from where the ammonia is formed what biomolecule have nh2 or nh3 in it that's amino acid so ammonia in your body is produced by it is produced by deamination of amino acid deamination of amino acid what is deamination for example boys and girls see if this is a structure of amino acid right and if i remove this nh2 group if i remove this nh2 group that process will be known as deamination and then it will turn into ammonia right so it is formed by the deamination of amino, uh, amino, amino acid second thing it is the most toxic it is the most toxic nitrogenous waste it is the most toxic nitrogenous waste so if it is most toxic you just can't uh, you know remove it like that for example if i say hcl whenever we have to use hcl you have to use it in the dilute form you must have heard of it right or if i ask you to have one uh, spoon of vinegar 
will you be able to drink it no because it's very you know uh, what you say sour right so what you do usually you will dilute it in the water or the same with the alcohol right so just like that because it's very toxic so we also need it to dilute it so for its elimination you have to dissolve it in a large amount of water and then you have to remove it from the body so this is what we say it needs large amount of water for its elimination it needs large amount of water for its elimination Fine. So, what organisms have uh, the ammo uh, ammonia as their main uh, nitrogen nitrogenous waste? So, all those organisms, all those organisms which have ammonia as their main nitrogenous waste, you call them as ammonotelic organism, right? And the process of removal of ammonia from the body is known as ammonotelism, right? The process of excretion of ammonia is known as ammonotelism. What do you call it as guys? Ammonotelism. Whereas organisms that excrete ammonia, what are they known as? They are known as ammonotelic. Ammono organism. Now, what are the various monotelic organisms? Let's have a look. First of all, we have invertebrates. In invertebrates, the nitrogenous waste is usually ammonia. Second, bony fishes. Bony fishes remove the ammonia in the form of ammonium ions through the gill surface. Then how do invertebrates remove the ammonia? Simply through diffusion. For example, porifers or ciliant rates, they remove uh, the nitrogenous waste which is ammonia or their main nitrogenous waste is ammonia, they are monotelic. So they do not have the, you know, uh, a much developed excretory system. So what they do, they will excrete ammonia simply through diffusion. They will remove the ammonia simply through diffusion from their body surface. For example, if this is a body of, uh, if this is a body of your porifers like this, okay. So, from their body, so through simple diffusion, ammonium ions will go out from its body or eliminated from its body, right? So, in invertebrates, the ammonium ions are diffused. Ammonium ions are diffused from body surface. From body surface, right? Now, what about these bony fishes? Fishes have gills, right? So, the ammonia mines will diffuse from the gills epithelium. Just like it is getting diffused from the body surface, in the bony fishes, it will get diffused from the gill epithelium. So, in the bony fishes, it will diffuse out from gill epithelium. From gill epithelium, right? Now, what are the other monotelic organisms? Let me give you some uh, more example. Now, what these are? Aquatic, aquatic arthropods. Yes, like prawns. Aquatic organisms are those that live in water. So, aquatic arthropods like prawns, you must have seen of crabs. These also uh, excrete ammonia, right? Aquatic arthropods and aquatic amphibians. They also excrete ammonia so aquatic amphibians guys like salamandra it also excrete the ammonia apart from that your amphibian like frog and toad they excrete urea but their tadpole larva they have larva yes the tadpole larva it excrete what ammonia so here tadpole larva also of frog it also excrete ammonia so that's about the most toxic one ammonia let's talk about the another less toxic than the ammonia waste that is the urea so urea is formed in the liver in humans in human it is formed in the liver it's white in color it's crystalline that means it's it's in the form of crystals and it is one lakh time how much 
one lakh time less toxic than ammonia so it's one lakh time less toxic than ammonia so how does urea formed urea is formed by the combination of co2 plus ammonia so when these two combine molecules may differ maybe i think uh, two nh2 are used here in the formation of urea so when we have to form urea co2 and ammonia they both unite to form urea so we say that by excretion what waste is removed in your by in your or removed from your body so we say that co2 and ammonia is removed during elimination of urea okay so by formation or by your excretory product what waste are you taking out from your body not urea urea is the waste which is going out but we are eliminating co2 and nh3 that is carbon dioxide and ammonia and it is formed in the liver so how uh, if it is formed in the liver then how in the body it is removed so for example the liver is forming urea here by co2 plus ammonia in the liver they are forming urea okay so imagine this is your liver now what will happen through the blood vessels imagine this is a blood vessel it will go to your kidney not directly but passing through the heart and then to the kidney through your circulation from liver it will go to the kidney and then kidney will remove the urea it will remove the urea okay so we say that the blood vessel that have maximum amount of urea will be your hepatic vein imagine this is a hepatic vein so hepatic vein is the one that takes blood away from the liver so when it is taking blood away from the liver it will be having a lot of urea it is having a lot of urea so we say that the maximum amount of urea is present in the hepatic vein and least amount of urea is present in the renal vein why because here the blood enters uh, through renal artery in the kidney that means it will be having a lot of urea and it uh, leaves through renal vein so renal vein have that blood from where or from which all the waste has been removed okay so we say that maximum urea is present in hepatic vein because liver is producing urea and minimum amount of urea is present in the renal vein fine okay next now organisms that produces urea they are ureotelic and the process of elimination or excretion of urea is known as ureotelism just like that of a monotelism okay so here process of removal of urea you call it as ureotelism right and organisms are ureotelic organism now what are the organisms that excretory waste is urea first of all guys you you are human being first of all we have our human second we have our cartilaginous fishes because cartilaginous fishes lives in they lives in marine water right where do you find shark sharks and rays they are always present in the ocean so cartilaginous fishes lives in the ocean so in ocean the salt water is so much or we can say the salt uh, the ocean water is hypertonic and they need to maintain their osmolarity so cartilaginous fishes they rather not excrete the urea though they excrete it it's true but some amount of urea is stored in the fishes so that they can maintain their osmolarity what is osmolarity yes the salts in the water or we can say salts present in per liter of the water okay or the solution so cartilaginous fishes they stores urea to maintain osmolarity okay guys osmolarity means to maintain the salt water content and also it is present in the frog and toad all right okay so that's it about uh, uh, your uh, what do you say the urea so do you have any idea how much urea is present in your blood how much urea is present in your blood do you have any idea yes 18 to 30 milligram so in human blood 18 
to 30 milligram of urea is present per 100 ml of blood. This is the urea concentration of us. See, so a lot of substances are there in the blood, guys. <laughs> All right, so next waste is your uric acid. So this is the least toxic one. This is the least toxic and it requires negligible. Negligible, negligible means no, like uh, near to no, okay. Negligible amount of water for elimination, for elimination. Okay, now, like ammonia was formed from the deamination of amino acid and urea was formed from the combination of CO2 and NH3. How are they formed? They are formed by the metabolism of nucleotides. In nucleotides, we have the nitrogenous bases like adenine, right? If you do not know what is a nucleotide, let me tell you. Your DNA is made up of small, small blocks, right? Like uh, proteins, they are made up of amino acid, right? Just like that, your DNA is made up of nucleotide. So when the nucleotides are destroyed, they have a component in them known as nitrogenous base like adenine and guanine. So when adenine and guanine are destroyed, they form your uric acid. So it is formed by the metabolism formed by the metabolism of nucleotide and what in the nucleotide or adenine and guanine okay if you do not know what is a nucleotide let me tell you imagine this is your dna dna is formed by small small units these units these are known as nucleotide okay these nucleotides are linked to each other via certain bonds like chemical bonds, okay. The nucleotide is made up of sugar, phosphate and nitrogenous base. So one such example of nitrogenous base is adenine and guanine. So when these adenine and guanines, they get metabolized, they form your uric acid okay so uric acid does not need uh, you know a lot amount of water for its for its elimination so we say that whenever or any organism that is excreting uric acid it will be present in the form of pellets or solid form right so it is excreted it is excreted in the form of pellets or in the solid form okay just like feces okay so where do you find these uh, uh, or what are the organisms that are uricotelic what are the organisms that are uricotelic you have first of all your favorite cockroach right so cockroach is uricotelic reptiles are uricotelic and birds and also land snails they are also uricotelic so all these organisms are uricotelic that means their main excretory waste is uric acid if you will see one thing that's common they all produces eggs and their eggs have coverings on them the eggs are shelled the reason is that because if the eggs are shelled for example in the uh, you know hen's egg which you eat at home it's calcareous that calcareous means it has shell of calcium carbonate so you'll see that the embryo is growing in that egg only the embryo is growing inside that egg only so if we if the nature would have given the nitrogenous waste that is ammonia the embryo would have been killed by ammonia because it is very toxic so that's why nature has given uric acid which is the least toxic form because the embryo has to grow inside the egg okay that's why they have this uh, nitrogenous waste all right guys so let's talk about the various excretory organs so first of all we'll talk about the first excretory organ and this is very important from here every year the questions are you know are asked in the uh, your neat examination first we have protonephridia or flame cell it is found in first of all platyhelminthes like flatworms also we have an example like planaria 
right so if you'll see the diagram of planaria in the ncert if you want to see it you can open your uh, animal kingdom chapter platyhelminthes there is a diagram which is given of planaria okay so then we have rotifers rotifers are a type of ascalmenthes annelids and cephalochordates like amphioxus so here what is the function of these flame cell proteinephridia they helps in osmoregulation what is osmoregulation ionic and fluid volume or we can also say salt water concentration or salt water balance you know in a water uh, the salt water balance or the osmotic balance is uh, generally maintained also by albumin of the blood if you remember yes or no so you know there is a set concentration or osmolarity in our body if it changes your excretory organs plays a vital role in maintaining it and you call that uh, you know you call that process of maintaining the osmolarity as osmoregulation so the main purpose of these flame cells and proteinephridia is not excretion but osmoregulation okay second nephridia these are tube like organs okay let me show you the diagrams i have brought this is planaria okay so you don't have to open the ncert now so in planaria number of flame cells you can see here this is one flame cell and they helps in osmoregulation so these why they known as flame cell because they have these cilia you can see so when these cilia moves they appear like flickering of the flame right so like a candle flame then we have the uh, nephridia which are tubular so you can see in these structure a lot of nephridias are present in the body of earthworm so now now you got to know the example where do we find the nephridia earthworm which is the annelid okay then it removes nitrogenous waste and maintain fluid and ionic balance so the purpose of nephridia is also excretion and osmoregulation that means it has a purpose of removing the nitrogenous waste from the body along with that it will also maintain the salt and water concentration next malpigeon tubule you have already seen that but uh, let me just show you once more again so these structure these are malpigeon tubule yellow colored blind sac or we have also seen that in cockroach they are present exclusively in insect and they remove nitrogenous waste and osmoregulation same it will also help in removal of uh, the uric acid and it will also helps in osmoregulation then antenal glands or green glands in the crustaceans of prawn why are they known as antenal glands because they are present on antennae present on antennae you know what are antennae we have done that in cockroach also so yes prawn also have antennae they are known as green gland because they are green in color and they are present in your crustaceans of prawn and its function is in excretion then kidneys in vertebrates in the vertebrates not in vertebrates and it helps in both excretion and osmoregulation so your primary excretory organ is kidney and the main purpose of kidney is to remove the waste and to maintain the salt water balance okay guys okay so uh, enough about these okay let's see the antennal glands also that's green in color you can see and they are present on the antenna <laughs> okay all right so next let's talk about us we have talked a lot about the animals uh, other animals let's talk about us because it's a chapter of human physiology so while talking about humans what uh, what are our various excretory organs first of all we have two types of excretory organs first is primary excretory organ primary excretory organ and that is your one pair of kidney so a primary excretory organ that helps in elimination of waste and also helps in osmoregulation and that is your kidney and second we also have secondary excretory organ now why we have classified into secondary and primary secondary uh, primary is something which is important main and doing the major portion of the work whereas secondary are the one which are doing a very little amount the contribution for that purpose is very low or less okay so here in the secondary excretory organ there are various excretory organs which uh, or there are various organs of your body which are playing certain roles in excretion we'll be talking about them in detail but first let's see what are these organs first of all in skin we have glands like oil gland and sweat gland like we have oil gland and we have sweat gland okay then we have liver then we have 
lungs right also your large intestine helps in the excretion of the waste we have uh, the large intestine and the salivary gland yes you will be surprised to know but salivary gland also helps in excretion if you do not believe me go back to the digestive system chapters notes and see what is the composition of saliva fine guys okay so let's move further and talk about the uh, human excretory system the primary one in the primary you can see these organ what are these you have one pair of kidney the kidney they are innervated by blood vessels and these blood vessels uh, first of all there will be one blood vessel that is uh, that is bringing the blood and that is your renal artery so this red one is renal artery from here the blood enters inside the blood enters inside the kidney and from where it is coming it is coming from aorta so as we have done in the previous lecture also aorta give rise to renal artery and then renal artery will form arterial inside the kidney and then capillaries and venules and renal vein will leave the kidney so this one is your renal vein okay so what is this i am labeling here this is renal vein and renal vein is draining into the large vein which is vena cava and this one is inferior vena cava because if you remember i have told you the superior one brings deoxygenated blood from the upper part of the body and inferior one brings the deoxygenated blood from the lower part of the body fine then we have one pair of ureters that helps in passaging or the transport of your urine because the uh, product that is formed by the kidneys is known as urine okay and then this urine is stored in this structure known as urinary bladder so the purpose of ureter is the transport of urine transport of urine and the ureters there also one pair and urinary bladder structure is storage of urine and then down the urinary bladder we have this structure known as urethra so that's a basic structure of your human excretory system let's talk about that in more detail so first of all we are going to discuss the ex uh, external structure so what's the shape of the kidney what's the shape of the kidney it's kidney bean shape <laughs> so what are kidney bean kidney beans are rajma in hindi you call them as rajma rajma is one of our favorite dishes among north indians i guess and um, rajma chawal it's love i tell you it's love right so you call that rajma that bean is kidney bean because it looks like a kidney right so it is bean shape and the, what is the color reddish brown in color it is reddish brown in color what are the dimensions you can see in that corner i have written the dimensions which are given in ncrt length is 10 to 12 cm width is 5 to 7 thickness is 2 to 3 and weight of one kidney 120 to 170 grams okay now where it is present it is present in abdomen present in abdomen and it is attached to dorsal body wall attached to dorsal body wall now what is this so you all know now what is abdomen upper portion the portion of body above the diaphragm is thorax below the diaphragm is abdomen and it is present in the lower abdomen it present in the lower abdomen so see if this is my body this is my ventral body wall and this is my dorsal body wall this is my dorsal body wall okay so in the lower abdomen it is directly attached to my dorsal body wall this one so if i have to do the kidneys operation obviously i cannot do because i'm not a doctor if you will do the kidneys operation of some person then you will put a section here okay so you'll cut here why because the kidneys are present on the dorsal side not on the ventral side so it is directly attached to the dorsal body wall so imagine this is the dorsal body wall and this is the ventral body wall okay i'm drawing this for you this is ventral side and this is the dorsal side dorsal body wall so you can see you can see your kidneys are directly attached to your dorsal body wall like this okay and 
द किडनी हैज पेरिटोनियम ओनली ऑन द वन साइड सो यू कॉल दिस एज रेट्रो पेरिटोनियल ऑर्गन ना वॉट आर रेट्रो पेरिटोनियल ऑर्गन गाइज नॉर्मली वी हैव सीन ऑल द ऑर्गन्स लाइक योर लंग्स like your gut like your heart they are completely covered on all the side by the double membrane bag known as peritoneum in lungs you call it as pleura in heart you call it as pericardium and in the gut you call it as serosa in serosa it is single layered okay so just like that kidney also have its peritoneum but it is only present on the one side so such organs which have peritoneum only on the one side you call them as retro peritoneal organ why it does not have on the other side because on the other side it is directly attached to the dorsal body wall i have just made dorsal body wall just like that but it is not like that right so it will be fused to the dorsal body wall like from this side like that okay Im imagine this is a dorsal body wall like this so that's why it has peritoneum only on the one side so what are retro peritoneal organs organs with peritoneum on one side only okay so this is your peritoneum now what is the exact what is the exact location of kidney it is present in the abdomen which abdomen lower side of abdomen and between 12th thoracic imagine here we have vertebrae so it is present between 12th thoracic and third lumbar vertebra what's the exact location if you want to find the kidney that is 12th it is it will be found between 12th thoracic vertebra and 12th thoracic vertebra or sometime they will also write the last thoracic vertebra because how many total vertebra we have the thoracic ones 12 see what are vertebras these are small bones of your this backbone vertebral column so the one which are present in the neck you call it as cervical the one which are present in the thoracic region are your uh, thoracic vertebra one which are present on this bend region of your lower abdomen they are lumbar you have five lumbar and 12 thoracic vertebrae so this one is present between last thoracic and third lumbar vertebra last thoracic and third lumbar vertebra okay 12th is also considered as last because there are total 12 vertebrae right so this is the location of your kidney so if i talk about kidney it is covered by some protective coverings now what are these so imagine this is your kidney so kidney will be an outer uh, will be having an outer covering of renal capsule first it will be having outer covering of renal capsule first renal capsule is made up of connective tissue and this will provide shape to the kidney this will provide shape to the kidney right so outside the kidney we have certain protective layers the first one is renal capsule then then you will be finding or you will find the covering of adipose tissue you know what's the purpose of this adipose tissue guys the reason of adipose tissue or the purpose of adipose tissue is it helps in shock absorption that's why nature has given you the layer of adipose of fat around various organs to help in absorbing the fat fine so then we have the outermost layer of renal fascia and renal fascia is the covering which will uh, help in the binding to the dorsal wall because here there will be then peritoneum and here renal fascia will help in the attachment of the uh, kidney to the dorsal body wall fine so then we have this layer which is the adipose layer and the outermost one this one renal fascia renal fascia is also made up of connective tissue renal capsule also made up of connective tissue and renal capsule it provides shape do not forget this point it provides shape to the kidney and what's the function of adipose it helps in shock absorption and what's the function of the renal fascia it helps in uh, attachment to the dorsal body wall so that's the external structure of your kidney let's talk about the internal structure so if you'll see internally externally the outermost covering here because not all the coverings are present will be of the renal capsule you can see that okay so renal capsule is the one that provides shape if you go more inner the entire or inside the kidney is divided into two zones there are two zones of the kidney there are two zones inside the kidney 
the outer portion or the outer zone is known as cortex and the inner zone is known as medulla inner is known as medulla so you can see this portion is the cortex portion and this where these triangular structures are there this portion is the uh, medulla let me highlight it for you i have brought this diagram because you know that's given in ncrt and direct diagrammatic questions can be asked from this uh, diagram okay so this portion the one which is light in color this entire is a cortex and this portion is medulla also some portion of cortex is entering inside the medulla so what i have highlighted in blue this entire portion is cortex okay so the portion of cortex that is going inside the medulla you call it as renal columns what do you call it as renal column or column of bertini or column of bertini now what are renal column or column of bertini these are extensions of cortex what are these extensions of cortex inside medulla inside medulla okay now in the medulla you can see this triangular structure known as medullary pyramid they are 8 to 10 in number they are 8 to 10 in number right and they contain structural and functional unit of kidney that is nephron and they contain nephron okay these you can say uh, your uh, medullary pyramid they will then open into small calyx or call as minor calyx these structure you can see these structure these are minor calyx what are these minor calyx the, these are minor calyx guys okay these minor calyx they are opening into they are opening into this one this this one major calyx so calyxes are nothing but the passages one are smaller other are larger the smaller ones are draining into the larger ones right so pink one are minor calyces and this green one is a major calyces so all these major calyces this is also major calyces they will open into this space they will open into this space and the name of this space is renal pelvis what is its shape funnel shape what is its shape funnel shape so listen to me one more time guys here so these renal pyramids they open into minor calyx minor calyx are 8 to 18 in number which will open into this green one major calyx major calyx they are 2 to 3 in number and they will open into this space known as renal pelvis which is funnel shape which is funnel shape okay then renal pelvis will open into ureters it will open into ureters now you can see there is a point from where renal artery and renal veins they are innervating can you see that right okay so if you'll see this diagram you can see this is a bend portion in this bend portion there will be uh, renal artery which is entering and renal vein that will be leaving so this bend portion this one you call it as hilum what you call it as hilum so hilum is that bend portion of your uh, kidney where renal artery and renal vein they are entering and putting exit right so this portion is hilum so here you can see easily this portion is hilum from here ureters is also leaving and blood vessels are also entering and exit okay guys that's the entire internal structure of your kidney let's move further and talk about the urinary bladder okay what about the urinary bladder urinary bladder is a sac like structure it's a sac like structure that means thala in hindi it's sac like structure and it is inverted pear shape it is inverted pear shaped okay second point to note here is that it's highly muscular organ it has a lot of muscles it is muscular organ it stores urine how much if it stores in it it definitely will have certain capacity around 500 to 800 ml urine can be stored maximum 800 so when it is filled up to 500 ml you will get a strong urge for urination okay let's see the structure of it now imagine this is your urinary bladder right 
the entire structure of urinary bladder is divided into three portion the upper is apex the middle larger portion is body or fundus and this little portion is neck down here is this portion known as urethra and urethra has an opening you call it as urethral meatus okay now if we'll see the wall of the urinary bladder the outermost covering is of a connective tissue known as adventitia and then you can see a number of muscles here number of muscles and a thick layer of muscle these muscles are smooth muscle and their name is detrusor muscle detrusor muscle is a kind of a smooth muscle it's a kind of a smooth muscle why it is known as detrusor why this uh, weird name detrusor means to you know push something down so when this muscle will be contracted the urine present inside that that will be pulled down okay or pushed down whatsoever you say in english then we have the layer of mucosa that is present in the form of folds known as rugae why we need mucosa here because the urine is acidic the urine is acidic in nature rugae are also found in stomach okay so here the urine is stored there are two openings for ureters from here the ureters enter and then there is a third opening uh, third opening for urethra so here a triangle is formed you can see here a triangle is formed you call it as trigone so the lumen is uh, lumen is having uh, or the you can say the inner empty space of urinary bladder it is having three openings and that forms a triangle and you call it as trigone and here the urine is stored if we talk about urethra urethra is guarded by sphincters what it is guarded by sphincters there are two sphincters the upper and the lower one the upper sphincter is the internal sphincter internal sphincter which is involuntary which is involuntary not under your control so that means it will be also made up of smooth muscles the lower sphincter or the external urethral sphincter you also call it as external urethral sphincter and internal one can also be known as internal urethral sphincter fine so these sphincters they are voluntary because you know whenever you got urge but you urinate according to your will right so here this is voluntary and this is the one that gives you the power to control your urination and that's made up of skeletal muscle okay guys so that's the structure of your urinary bladder why i am teaching the entire structure though it's not in the ncrt reason is there is a topic in ncrt for urination or micturition so for that you need to understand the structure of urinary bladder okay all right so let's talk about the some question the position of kidneys in human is interperitoneal retroperitoneal intraperitoneal none of these it's retroperitoneal answer two next columns of bertini in the kidney of mammals are formed as extensions of so what are these columns they are the extensions of what cortex and cortex which is going inside medulla answer is okay next identify the structure and find the correct statement as i've told you the diagrams are important so always pay attention to the diagram especially of ncrt okay so here a b c d are given a is medulla which forms outer part of the kidney no a is the cortex so this is incorrect you have to find the correct one b is renal pelvis very true this is b this is renal pelvis and contain nephrons nephrons are present in the medullary pyramids c is renal capsule and provides shape and covers the kidney very true this is renal capsule and provides shape to the kidney d is the ureters very true but is does not stores urine it transport urine so answer to this question will be guys 3 okay next kidney are reddish brown bean shaped structures situated between what is the exact location of the kidney between last thoracic also the 12th and third lumbar answer is 1 others are wrong it is saying third lumbar and fifth lumbar seventh cervical cervical is in neck kidney is not in the thorax right and fifth thoracic and last lumbar no exactly last one okay next next we have 
all right okay so the next we are going to talk about is nephron guys let's talk about nephrons so what about nephron nephron are structural and functional unit structural and functional unit of your kidney how many are there around 1 million around 1 million let's draw the diagram let's draw the diagram so if this is this is the first part of your nephron that's bowman's capsule okay this bowman's capsule is innervated by blood vessels so here an afferent arteriole is entering an efferent arteriol is leaving. Efferent arteriol is broader than the efferent arteriol, as you can see. Right? So, blood vessels are entering into this space. And what is this? This is your afferent arteriol. Afferent arteriol have broader, have broad lumen as comparison to the efferent one. So, the name efferent and afferent is given on the basis of the flow of blood because afferent one is giving blood to this portion and efferent one is taking away the blood. Now, when it goes inside this portion, what is the name of this portion? Bowman's capsule. It is forming a tuft of capillaries. It is forming a tuft of capillary. You call it as glomerulus. You call it as glomerulus so glomerulus is nothing it is the tuft of capillaries that means it's a cluster of capillaries so from here your structure of nephron starts so this particular portion is known as renal corpuscle this entire structure is known as renal corpuscle so whenever i'm writing a word renal corpuscle i am talking about bowman's capsule plus glomerulus so, from here your nephron structure start. Okay. So, now this will lead to the tubular part of your nephron, the tube-like part, right? So, the first we have a highly convoluted, convoluted means curvy portion and the name of this portion is PCT. What is its name? Proximal convoluted tubule. Proximal convoluted tubule. In short, you call it as PCT. Right now, I am not talking about what the parts does. I am just showing you how the nephron it looks like. Okay. So, the first portion is a renal, uh, renal corpuscle, which is this much portion. Okay. And then we have the tubular portion. It starts from PCT. The proximal means, proximal means near. If we say this is my arm, this is the proximal portion of my arm. This is the distal portion. Proximal is this one. Why? Because it is near to the body. Okay. Now, this proximal convoluted tubule, it will lead to the loop of Henle. It will lead to the loop of Henle like this. Okay. Then loop of Henle will open into DCT, just like PCT, it is also convoluted or curvy because it's away, so it's distal convoluted tubule. And this one will open into collecting duct. And this one open into collecting duct like this. Okay. So this portion you can see how the uh, how the fluid inside it will move. You call it as filtrate. It moves in this direction okay so the po this portion is known as descending limb of loop of henle the entire portion is loop of henle this portion is descending limb of loop of henle okay and this one is the ascending limb of loop of henle So, this portion is thicker, you, so you call it as thick limb and this one is thinner, so you call it as thin limb. Okay. And the entire structure, this is a loop of Henle or Henle's loop. And this portion is known as DCT, distal convoluted tubule. And then it will open into this portion known as collecting duct. Collecting duct. 
okay a lot of dcts enter inside the collecting duct the collecting duct is common and a number of dcts of various nephrons it enters or drains inside the common collecting duct now what's its exact location depending upon the cortex and medulla so if you'll see this entire portion this one is present in the cortex and this portion is present in the medulla if i demarcate it that this entire portion this one is the cortex right above that is a cortex and below that is a medulla so your renal corpuscle pct dct they are present in the cortex whereas your loop of henle and your collecting duct it is present in the medulla this is very important and you must remember this okay guys so we have the upper portion it is present in your cortex and the lower portion in the medulla now the nephrons they are of two types nephrons they are of two types guys what are the types one are the cortical nephrons another are the juxtamedullary nephron other are the juxtamedullary nephrons you heard it right yes there are two types of nephrons one are the cortical nephrons another are the juxtamedullary nephrons so the cortical nephrons they are are in the you know maximum amount around 85% of all the nephrons present in your kidney they are cortical whereas juxtamedullary are just 15% fine these nephrons they are you know larger in size sorry shorter in size they are longer in size they are longer right if i talk about the size they are shorter what's the reason because in this the loop of henle is either absent or reduced or short in this one the loop of henle is very longer the cortical one they are present what's the location they are present in the cortex region whereas this one its loop of henle goes inside the medulla so half part of them is deep in medulla is present in the deeper portion in the medulla how i will show you that also they are usually present or they are usually functioning or they perform a function or uh, uh, in the normal condition whenever your body is going good so they work in the normal conditions whereas these work in the water shortage condition in the water shortage condition all right another thing that uh, your uh, cortical nephrons have they have peritubular capillaries whereas these they have both peritubular capillaries and vasa recta now what is a vasa recta i'll show you right now okay see guys if this is your juxtamedullary nephron okay this is how the juxtamedullary nephron it looks like the upper portion is in the cortex the medulla uh, portion contains the loop of henle because it has longer loop of henle if it would be the uh, cortical one the cortical one would have been started here it have a very short loop of henle and would have it would have been ended like that this is how the cortical nephrons are okay so in the cortical nephron or first of all let's see the juxtamedullary nephron in juxtamedullary nephrons you have network of capillaries you call it as peritubular capillary so all these uh, these are blood vessels you are looking at these are peritubular capillaries so peritubular capillaries are present in the cortical region as well as in the medullary region these are also peritubular capillaries but apart from that just parallel to loop of henle another blood vessel is running which is u shaped this one this is vasa recta what is it vasa recta you can see here so vasa recta is a u shape which shape u shape blood vessel running parallel to the loop of henle and it is present exclusively in the juxtamedullary nephron because it runs a mechanism or with the help of these vasa recta a mechanism is going on or a mechanism starts in our body during water shortage condition that's why these uh, these parts are very much important from juxtamedullary nephron whereas in the cortical nephron you don't have loop of henle so you, you also do not have vasa recta the, uh, the cortical nephrons are just like that they have very short loop of henle and all that they will be having is peritubular capillary okay so this is a difference or so these are the differences between cortical nephron and the juxtamedullary now let's talk about urine formation how the urine is formed in your body 
now this is something uh, important and the, there will be a lot of things that you have to listen to me very carefully because you know here comes the part of physiology okay so the urine formation takes place by three steps the first one is glomerulo or glomerular filtration and you also call it as ultra filtration or ultra filtration so if someone asks you or imagine there is a very uh, uh, you know your younger brother or sister a very little child in your house if somehow they ask you out of curiosity like didi or bhaiya or brother sister how is the urine formed in a body then how will you say how will you explain to them you will say the urine is formed by the filtration of your blood because they know what the blood is because whenever they you know get a little wound or something the, they know about blood so when the blood gets filtered that becomes a urine okay now second thing or the second process in the urine formation is reabsorption and the third one is secretion third one is secretion so what's the ultra filtration let's talk about that for that we need to draw the diagram of the bowman's capsule so imagine guys this is your bowman's capsule bowman's capsule is having simple squamous epithelium here right it is having simple squamous epithelium and it also have certain cells here a very you know special cells they appear like the feet you call them as podocyte what you call them as podocyte like this okay and these podocytes if you can see these have slits for example if this is your feet and in these feet there are slits present so the cells these cells they appear like a feet so you call them as podocyte and they also have slits like we have the spaces in between our fingers okay so this is a bowman's capsule so bowman's capsule have these cells known as podocytes okay and also there is a simple squamous epithelium of bowman's capsule simple squamous epithelium i'm just i'm just writing uh, SKU. I think you will understand. If not, let me just write in the complete words. All right. Now, and also you know how the glomerulus is formed. The afferent arterioles enter here, and then, and it forms tuft of capillaries here, known as glomerulus, like this. Okay. Now this blood vessel is also having what? Because these are capillaries, right? If I'm not wrong, these are capillaries, and they also have simple squamous epithelium, known as endothelium. They have endothelium so this is endothelium what is endothelium guys simple squamous epithelium of capillaries simple squamous epithelium of capillary or blood vessels okay now what will happen next because these are epithelium cell definitely between them will be present a basement membrane so this is a basement membrane okay so the epithelium epithelium of capillary basement membrane and epithelium of bowman's capsule together they are forming together they are forming filtration membrane so if i say what is this structure this structure is your filtration membrane so filtration membrane is formed of epithelium of bowman's capsule epithelium of capillary and the basement membrane between them so the filtration membrane is formed of three things epithelium of bowman's capsule basement membrane between them and third the endothelium of your capillary and what do capillary have in it blood why it is known as a filtration membrane because the filtration will take place passing through the filtration membrane okay so here guys you can see this is a uh, these small portion these are slit like pores do not forget them also okay so what happened okay let me just write it first so what happened here is present blood so when the blood gets filtered out and it enters inside the bowman's capsule now that blood has been filtered you call it as filtrate what you call it as filtrate that is the first that is the first process of urine formation glomerular filtration or ultra filtration because glomerulus is responsible for the filtration because it is having the blood so that's why you call it as glomerular filtration why it is known as ultra filtration because the pores are present slit pores anything 
that will be able to pass through that pores only that will become the part of the filtrate others will remain in the blood so large proteins and number of substances cannot pass through that so we are filtering it you know we are filtering it very finely so that's why you call it as ultra filtration so here we have blood what do we have here inside that blood right now this blood will get filtered out and you call it as filtrate so it has entered inside these tubules now it is known as a filtrate so this first process of urine formation is known as ultra filtration so how does ultra filtration takes place let's talk about that so imagine this is your bowman's capsule this is your bowman's capsule and here is your afferent arterial this is your afferent arterial bringing the blood so this afferent arterial is bringing around 1100 to 1200 ml of blood per minute which is approximately 1 by 5th of cardiac output remember cardiac output we have done it in the chapter body fluids and circulation guys right so here around or in one minute 100, 100 1 or 1100 or 1000 to 100 to 1000 to 200 ml of blood per minute gets filtered out it comes here and it gets filtered and it forms a filtrate right so for filtration we need certain pressures what we need certain pressure so these pre this pressure that helps in the filtration is known as net filtration pressure is known as net filtration pressure the net filtration pressure is approximately between 10 to 20 mm of mercury and this is a pressure that helps in filtration that helps in filtration okay so there is a pressure that has been exerted on this portion that will allow the filtration of the blood and filtrate will be formed right so this filtration is so fine so you call it as ultra filtration through pores the proteins cannot pass as i've told you through pores proteins cannot pass so that's why you call it as ultra filtration now lot of substances lot of substances will be present in a filtrate so we say that around this uh, 1 by 5 of the cardiac output enters inside here and get filtrate so how much filtrate is formed if i say this much amount of blood is filtered then how how much amount of filtrate comes here around 125 ml per minute or we can say 180 liter per day filtrate is formed which is your gfr glomerular filtration rate what is glomerular filtration rate the amount of filtrate formed the amount of filtrate formed per minute or per day that is your glomerular filtration rate how much blood is going on here in one minute this much amount but how much filtrate is formed this much is formed so if i say in uh, per day 180 liter of filtrate is formed do you excrete 180 liter of urine no we don't so because we do not excrete 180 liter of the urine then where does the or, and i say if we only excrete one to two liter of urine per day then where does the rest 99 percent goes if i say here the filtrate has been formed right and the urine formed is urine formed per day is 1 to 1 1.5 liter but your gfr is 180 liter per day then where does 99 percent of the filtrate goes so 99 percent of filtrate gets reabsorbed now what is this reabsorption so once the filtrate is formed the filtrate accumulates here it, or it goes to your tubules so in the tubules in the tubules or from the tubules it is taken back and it is put back in the blood for example there are certain molecules that can enter inside the filtrate like sodium ions like glucose like amino acid you don't want to waste them up you don't want that amino acids and nutrients they will go waste into the urine and gets out from the body so what we do we take them back we take them back and put it in the blood and this process is known as reabsorption all right now sometimes very harmful substances like hydrogen ion 
if for example the concentration of hydrogen ions increases in the blood the blood will become acidic right and the shift will be the right side in the breathing and exchange so we don't want those h positive ions to be in your blood so we wanted to throw them out through urine so what uh, what our kidney does our kidney secrete them that means now certain substances from blood can easily enter inside the filtrate and they will become the part of urine and that process is known as secretion okay so in the reabsorption the substances are taken back are taken back in secretion the substances are put in the filtrate these are uh, usually or we put these substances into the filtrate mind my english i'm so sorry right <laughs> so now what are these substances that get secreted they can be h positive ion they can be potassium ions fine so all these substances they got secreted whereas uh, uh, the substances that are useful they are taken back now let's see how does your different tubules how they reabsorb and secrete so anything that is going inside the tubule is secreted for example i am uh, marking that with the the color pink which are secreted okay so here all these substances they are secreted all these substances they are secreted here urea is also secreted from here urea is absorbed it is secreted so we'll start from the this portion here the filtration takes place so they have nothing to do with the reabsorption and secretion the reabsorption and secretion is exclusively done by your tubules so tubule starts from pct so first we have is pct we say that around 70 to 80 percent okay let me write this down in white color because in comments most of you say is that ma'am the pink color is not visible right so around 70 to 80 percent of water and electrolytes they are reabsorbed in pct you heard it right in pct if you remember the pct we have done it in the uh, first chapter structural organization pct have cuboidal epithelium and that is brush bordered a lot of time the questions have been asked from this one the pct have brush bordered epithelium and that one which one cuboidal okay all right now in PCT, a lot of substances, they got actively reabsorbed like glucose, amino acid and sodium ions. So here, glucose, amino acid and sodium ions, they are actively reabsorbed. Active absorption means that it will use, it will use ATP. Whereas always your nitrogenous phase, whenever they are reabsorbed, they are reabsorbed passively, right? So for example, here, uh, if it's somehow nitrogenous uh, substances are reabsorbed or secreted, they always uh, uh, occurs without the help of ATP. Okay. Now let's talk about the loop of Henle or let's talk about the another portion. So here H positive ion and uh, uh, the ammonia mines, they are very bad. They're the excretory waste. So you will put it into the filtrate and that process is secretion. Okay. Now let's about loop of Henle. So if I talk about loop of Henle guys, in the loop of Henle, the ascending one, the ascending one, this is the one which undergoes minimum reabsorption. Out of the entire tubules, if someone asks you where minimum reabsorption takes place, you will say loop of loop of Henle. Which part of loop of Henle? Ascending limb. Okay, so as you can see, this portion, as you can see, there is a descending limb and there is a ascending limb. The descending limb is only permeable to etched, uh, water, whereas the, sorry, I, I, did, did I say ascending? No, no, I'm so sorry if I say ascending. This is the descending limb. The descending limb is only permeable to water, whereas ascending limb is only permeable to salt. This one, th this thing you have to remember because that will also help you in counter current. Okay. So here ascending limb is only permeable to salts or electrolytes. Only permeable to electrolytes. All right. Whereas the descending limb is only permeable to water. 
only permeable to water this is the deal <laughs> this is the deal i will only reabsorb water and you will only reabsorb salts okay also as you can see in ascending limb the urea is secreted the urea is secreted going to the dct dct is very important guys dct is a portion where conditional reabsorption conditional reabsorption of sodium ions and water takes place now what is conditional reabsorption see normally other tubules are doing the reabsorption all the way they don't need anyone's permission but in dct when someone will tell the dct to reabsorb uh, sodium and, and water only then the dct will reabsorb it for example if i say there is a hormone aldosterone when aldosterone bind to dct only then dct reabsorb uh, the sodium ions and water and this type of reabsorption is known as conditional reabsorption right apart from that there is also excretion of k positive and h positive ion and reabsorption of nacl and hco3 negative ions fine next collecting duct collecting duct is the one which helps in the reabsorption of a lot of water reabsorption of water and secretion secretion of h positive ion and k positive ion and h uh, sorry and yeah h, i have already written h positive ions fine so what's the function of secretion of these harmful substances first obviously elimination of these bad substances second because if you remove the h positive ion that will lead to the balance of ph and also we can in uh, other ways we can say it helps in ionic balance what balance ionic balance so wherever the secretion is taking place guys wheresoever the secretion is taking place its function is ionic balance its function is ionic balance okay or ph balance right i hope you will never forget this point all right so let's move further and talk about water conservation or counter current mechanism so counter current mechanism is a mechanism that will help you to conserve water let's see how it does or how can you conserve water so let's get started with the counter current mechanism what about counter current mechanism so this is a mechanism to make a concentrated urine for example your body does not want to lose a lot of water then what we can do we can run this mechanism that is counter current mechanism so to run the counter current mechanism what are the nephrons that are responsible for this or what are the nephrons that work during water shortage condition you know now because we have done that already juxta medullary nephrons right so juxta medullary nephrons are the one juxta medullary nephrons they are the one that runs counter current mechanism in our body and what is that mechanism the mechanism that helps in the concentration of urine that means less water in the urine okay so now how does it work how does it work and why this mechanism is counter current counter current means opposite flow what is the meaning of counter current guys opposite flow this counter current mechanism is a success or why is it possible because we have loop of henle and in loop of henle if you know there is a differential permeability of your ions if you remember the descending limb is only permeable to water and ascending limb is only permeable to electrolytes and also the flow in both the limbs is opposite that's why the name is descending and the ascending if you remember in the descending limb the flow of filtrate is towards downside and in the ascending limb it is on the upper side so we say that this is opposite flow and opposite flow is also termed as counter current so counter current means opposite flow so one such opposite flow we have in loop of henle okay similarly if you remember in the juxta medullary nephron you have vasa recta so there is also the opposite flow going on in the vasa recta like this just like loop of henle have ascending and descending limb just like that vasa recta also have descending and ascending limb right so another thing here to point uh, to note down is that there is also the opposite flow in the vasa recta second thing because these uh, loop of henle it has differential permeability that means the descending is only permeable to water and 
the ascending is only permeable to salt that's why counter current is a success we'll discuss about that in detail i'm just talking about certain points right so here second thing that is a success for the counter current or that's why the counter current is running that is differential permeability differential permeability in loop of henle like the descending limb this is a descending limb this is a ascending limb it is only permeable to water and that one is only permeable to salt third thing because vasa recta and loop of henle they are present very near to each other that's why your urine can be concentrated and the last point here to note down is that both are present bit, uh, towards each other or near to each other in english you also use the word proximity so proximity means near the proximity between loop of henle and vasa recta so due to these conditions due to the physiology and the structural conditions of the nephron the counter current mechanism can run inside your body and it can cause the formation of concentrated urine so we are saying mechanism of concentration of the filtrate that means you will make concentrated urine the urine which have less water how much concentrated that can be uh, we can make urine we can make the urine four times concentrated right so by this mechanism urine can be four times concentrated four times concentrated right okay now let's talk about things now okay so now everyone pay attention here and listen to each and every line that i say very carefully okay all right let's get started with this one this is loop of fenle this is vasa recta this is how in juxta medullary nephron the things are arranged and we say that there is a opposite flow in the descending limb and in the ascending limb this is the descending limb this is the ascending limb similarly here in the vasa recta this one is the descending limb of vasa recta and this is the ascending limb of vasa recta okay now imagine this descending limb of loop of henle is bringing the filtrate from the pct and contains a lot of water and contains a lot of water our purpose is to take that water which is present here to take that water which is present here and put it back into the vasa recta which is a blood vessel what do you want to do we want the reabsorption of water we want the reabsorption of water we want that entire water from the filtrate should go inside the blood vessel why because if it goes in the ascending limb and then into the collecting duct from passing through the dct then into the collecting duct that urine or that filtrate with lot of water will become the part of the urine and urine will be having a lot of water and your body will face water scarcity or water shortage condition you may feel dehydration and you will feel a lot of urine or you will uh, not feel you will form a lot of urine right we don't want to do that so what we do what we do or what our body does at that point the ascending limb it started reabsorbing nacl and this nacl gets accumulated in these spaces you call it as interstitium or you call it as medullary interstitium because this is medulla this is medulla this is medullary interstitium if you remember there are two uh, uh, areas inside the kidney one is the cortex another is the medulla right so above this line is the cortex below this is medulla your pct dct and uh, bowman's capsule and uh, your glomerulus they are present in the cortex whereas juxta in juxta medullary nephrons the loop of henle is very longer along with the vasa recta and this is in the medulla okay now because it is reabsorbing a lot of nacl it is reabsorbing a lot of nacl here the osmolarity of the medullary interstitium will increase and you can see the osmolarity down the medulla in this hairpin loop what do you call it as hairpin loop because it looks like the hairpin right so at this hairpin loop of vasa recta near here the osmolarity have been increased four times how many times four times fine and here guys you have a, a dct and here you have collecting duct this is how your nephron is okay all right now now how the uh, counter current mechanism starts the ascending limb of loop of henle it started reabsorbing a lot of nacl a lot of nacl okay 
as the blood is coming here from 300 milli osmolarity the osmolarity in blood is very less or we can see the water content in the blood is more so here the water content in the blood is more and you all know that now the salt now this uh, salt will enter inside your blood so ascending limb reabsorb nacl it enters into medullary interstitium and the entire salt enter inside the blood so down the medulla because now it has a lot of nacl it has a lot of nacl the osmolarity increases the osmolarity increases so here you can see a lot of nacl has been entered so osmolarity of the blood has been increased many times or several folds how many folds four times okay nothing uh, nothing complicated just ascending limb is reabsorbing nacl and it has entered its inside the descending limb of fossa recta okay now as the nacl has been entered here and when it will reach towards the descending limb of loop of henle and you all know that descending limb of loop of henle is rich in water so this one will reabsorb a lot of water since the osmolarity of the blood has been increased so entire water will move entire water will move inside the vasa recta and that was your purpose you wanted that the filtrous water will move inside the blood of the vasa recta but the mechanism um, or everything is working on the basis of osmolarity so what happened first the ascending limb of loop of henle reabsorb nacl nacl goes into the blood because if the blood will be hyperosmotic only then the water will go into that na so what all the things we have done we have just made uh, your blood uh, hyperosmotic okay if uh, if you have uh, read here if anything has higher osmolarity water will move inside that and our purpose was to take all the water from the filtrate and move in, into the blood so what we did what we did eventually we added a lot of nacl inside our blood as a result entire water from the filtrate moves inside the blood how how did we entered or how did we increase the osmolarity of the blood by reabsorbing nacl from ascending limb of loop of henle and then we give it to the blood now blood becomes hyperosmotic now all the water from the descending limb will enter inside the blood and our purpose is fulfilled okay also because nacl has been uh, increased or the osmolarity has been increased in the medullary interstitium this collecting duct will also reabsorb a lot, a lot of water and this entire water will also enter inside your blood which limb ascending limb of the blood okay so this is what countercurrent mechanism is now second thing is that since ascending limb of loop of henle is reabsorbing a lot of nacl because it has reabsorbed a lot of nacl its osmolarity can also get disturbed its osmolarity can also get disturbed so here the collecting duct comes to the rescue so collecting duct will reabsorb urea collecting duct here okay i'll write it will reabsorb urea for example it it has reabsorbed urea okay so now this urea will enter inside the thin limb of the ascending limb of loop of henle so when the urea will enter inside this it will keep on maintaining the osmolarity you know the reason of maintaining osmolarity is if the osmolarity of ascending limb of loop of henle got decreased it will stop reabsorbing nacl but we want nacl should be reabsorbed once these condition become isotonic that means the concentration of nacl here and here if it becomes constant or same it will not reabsorb nacl so what our body did because our body is very smart it started reabsorbing urea so if the concentration of urea increases inside the filtrate of ascending limb of loop of henle the osmolarity will increase and the uh, the filtrate will always be osmo uh, will be higher in osmolarity so entire nacl will move from high concentration to low concentration that's the purpose of having urea here so what are the two key uh are uh, these uh, molecules or solutes that are responsible for countercurrent mechanism always guys always nacl and urea nacl and urea are very much important important for countercurrent or countercurrent right nacl you understand what why, what about urea this urea from collecting duct it enters into which limb of loop of henle ascending 
and ascending have two portion one thick another thin which one it will go inside or in which uh, segment it will go it will go inside the thin limb right so it will enter into thin limb of ascending limb of loop of la now what will happen the osmolarity of loop of henle loh means loop of henle will increase and it will reabsorb nacl so these lines you will not get uh, anywhere else in not even in the ncrt so that's why i made you write these one uh, because the reason is you will never got to understand it from anywhere that why urea is playing a vital role in the countercurrent mechanism okay and generally the question is also asked from this one okay so that's about uh, your countercurrent let's read the ncrt all right okay so here you can see guys mechanism of concentration of the filtrate please open your ncrt and mark the important lines that i am talking about okay mammals have the ability to produce a concentrated urine so yes we can produce concentrated urine what is a concentrated urine urine with less water urine with less water the henle's loop and vasa recta play a significant role in this so what are the two organs that are playing an important role one is a blood vessel vasa recta another the loop of henle of your nephron first question that can be asked which organs are playing a vital role in countercurrent second the flow of filtrate in the two limbs of henle's loop is in the opposite direction and thus form a countercurrent so the flow is in both the limb of loop of henle is in the opposite flow the flow of blood through the two limbs of vasa recta is also in a countercurrent pattern so similarly you can also see the opposite flow in the vasa recta the proximity between henle's loop and vasa recta as well as the countercurrent in them helps in maintaining and increasing osmolarity towards the inner medullary interstitium that is from 300 milliosmol in the cortex to about 1200 milliosmol in the inner medulla so because they are very present towards or they are present near to each other and also they have opposite flow and they have differential permeability also that's why we can make the increase in the osmolarity trend towards the uh, inner medulla that is from 300 to 1200 milliosmol okay the this gradient is mainly caused by nacl and urea nacl is transported by the ascending limb of loop of henle which is exchanged with the descending limb of vasa recta listen to me very carefully okay here read it nicely nacl is transported by the ascending limb of loop of henle okay so it is saying nacl is transported from the ascending limb of loop of henle this is true ascending limb is transporting nacl now it is saying which is exchange with the descending limb of vasa recta so it is exchange with the descending limb of vasa recta this is what we have done okay now all right nacl is returned to the interstitium by the ascending portion of vasa recta now this one will be here here this is the ascending limb because it is picking up the water so it will move all the nacl away this is what basic osmolarity that you also studied in the uh, botany also okay that's why the water is entering it will uh, it will send all the nacl away because here the conditions are what these are hypoosmotic now similarly small amount of urea enters a thin segment of the descending limb of henle's loop which is transported back to the interstitium by the collecting tubule okay now what it is saying nacl nacl uh, sorry urea urea is getting inside the thin limb of uh, loop of henle and then it will go here and it is reabsorbed by the collecting duct or the tubules all right so here you can see the urea recycling is occurring here it is giving urea or urea is entering into the filtrate and then it is reabsorbed by the collecting duct or tubules fine okay ncrt has not mentioned anything about the water but i have uh, explained you everything this is how you concentrate the urine okay because uh, the major purpose is to take the water from the blood vessel so they have missed one line okay and this is how everyone or every student reading the ncrt or reading this paragraph of ncrt really gets confused now you don't need to confuse okay guys all right now 
similarly small amount of urea enters okay this is what we have done the above uh, described transport of substances facilitated by the special arrangement of henle's loop and wasser reactor is called counter current mechanism this mechanism helps to maintain a concentration gradient how much concentration gradient guys how much four times right uh, presence of such interstitial gradient helps in an easy passage of water from the collecting tubule thereby concentrating the filtrate human kidney can produce nearly four times concentrated than the initial filtrate so as comparison to the filtrate we can uh, we can make four time concentrated urine okay all right so just for your better understanding let me explain everything one more time you know sometimes these things are i know it according to my experience every child every child feel this top, topic to be very difficult but you don't need to do, do that right it's very simple if you know there is an opposite flow in the limbs and you know the permeability of the loop of la this is very simple first of all nsl will reabsorb all the uh Oh, sorry, the ascending limb of loop of Henle will reabsorb all the NaCl. Now, this NaCl will enter inside the descending limb of Wasser recta. Now, because this has become hyperosmotic, entire water will enter inside this and NaCl will leave and enter into the medullary interstitium. This is a basic osmosis that you study in the botany. So, this is what all things are that I have explained you here in a very simple way. What we want to make? We want that the entire water should enter inside the blood. So, for that we need our blood to be hyperosmotic. Okay. So, the NaCl, once it has entered inside the blood, now water will enter and NaCl will leave the blood. Okay. This is what it is. Alright guys. So, let's talk about the another very important topic that is regulation of kidney function. But before regulation of kidney function, let's talk about certain basics because these, these are very important in uh, regulation part. Okay. All right. So, we have done that there is a net filtration pressure that we need for filtration. If this pressure is there, the filtration will occur, which is around 10 mm of mercury. Okay. Now, what contains these pressure or what are the various pressures that make the net filtration pressure? First of all, you all know we have this afferent arteriole. We have afferent arteriole. Okay. If the pressure of blood is more inside the afferent arteriole, there will be more pressure inside the capillaries also. And that pressure is known as glomerular hydrostatic pressure glomerulo hydrostatic pressure this pressure is a positive pressure that means this pressure will always help you in filtration the value of glomerulo hydrostatic pressure is 60 mm of mercury so what is ghp ghp is glomerulo hydrostatic pressure and this is a pressure of blood this is a pressure of blood so, whenever there is a vasoconstriction, vasoconstriction means your blood vessel has, uh, uh, has made certain resistant like this. This is vasoconstriction. Okay. Vasoconstriction means your blood vessels have been constricted. At that time, the pressure of the blood will increase and this will increase the glo uh, glomerular filtration rate. If the pressure inside the blood increases... Okay, if the pressure inside the blood increases, then glomerular hydrostatic pressure will also increase. What is a glomerular hydrostatic pressure? This is a pressure of blood. Pressure of blood that helps in filtration. Okay, now guys, this is a pressure. If vasoconstriction occur, this pressure will increase. Similarly, if the opposite occur, that is vasodilation. Vasodilation means the lumen expands. The lumen expands. There is uh, no resistance, hence the blood pressure will be less and there will be less GFR. So, this is how the pressure of depend uh, or the pressure of blood is so much important uh, for uh, your net filtration pressure and hence your glomerular filtration rate. Fine. Another pressures which are opposing pressure, what are these? Now, in the blood, a lot of you know colloidal particles are present. A lot of colloidal particles are present like your proteins. They might block the filtration membrane. For example, here is a large protein. There is a large protein and this protein is blocking the filtration membrane. This is acting as a colloidal particle. Okay. Now, this type of pressure that is exerted on the opposite side, this will inhibit the filtration or it will oppose the filtration. So, this type of a pressure is exerted 
towards the opposite side and this is the negative pressure which is B blood colloid osmotic pressure so what is bcop blood colloid osmotic pressure you can see its value is 30 mm of mercury so this is a uh, opposite pressure or opposing pressure now another point to note here is that once the filtration has taken place a lot then a lot of filtrate will be formed a lot of filtrate will be formed here okay now this filtrate will also give the opposing pressure which is BCHP, this is also opposing pressure, blood, uh, sorry, Bowman's capsular, Bowman's capsular hydrostatic pressure. It's just like guys, when you, uh, you know, filter tea in the cup or glass, when you filter tea in a cup or a glass, if the, uh, the, if the glass fills up to the top level, then the tea or uh, whatever you are filtering, it will come towards the uh, your uh, sieve, right? For example, you are sieving tea, you are filtering tea. At that time, if the uh, glass uh, gets fills up up to the uh, you know upper surface level, so the entire sieve will not be able to filter it right or it will not be able to filter your tea so this is what happened in the bone malware ca uh, capsular hydrostatic pressure so all these pressure they form a net filtration pressure that is very important for filtration right so here what's the takeaway if there is vasoconstriction there will be more blood pressure there will be more glomerular filtration rate if there is vasodilation if there is less blood pressure there will be less glomerular filtration rate fine guys okay now let's start about the regulation part so the regulation of kidney function is uh, it takes place by various mechanism one by the hypothalamus another by the glomerular hydrostatic uh, sorry <laughs> juxtaglomerular uh, apparatus and third one it occurs with the help of your what do you say uh, heart now you say ma'am heart yes so shortly you'll get to know how so regulation why are we doing regulation sometimes your body may feel the you know there is a possibility that you are drinking less water and you feel dehydrated right so at that time your body needs to come up with the mechanism where it can conserve water so one such is with the help of a adh adh is also known as vasopressin this is a hormone adh nt diuretic hormone it is known as antidiuretic hormone because it prevent diuresis what is diuresis formation of dilute urine formation of dilute urine opposite to the concentrated that means this one will have a lot of water and there will be water loss so this hormone is antidiuretic that means it will not let the formation of dilute urine it will help in the formation of concentrated urine and it will preserve your water or it will you know it will uh, prevent the loss of water why it is known as vasopressin because it has a very important function that it causes vasoconstriction it causes vasoconstriction so when there is vasoconstriction there is increase in blood pressure and then there will be increase in gfr these are the two functions which are performed by this hormone now let's uh, talk about where this hormone is present so this hormone is synthesized by hypothalamus hormone is synthesized by hypothalamus what is hypothalamus it's also a gland and it is also part of your brain it is synthesized by the hypothalamus but it is stored in posterior pituitary stored in posterior pituitary okay let me show you one thing for example if this is hypothalamus this is pituitary gland and this is posterior pituitary okay and here certain neuronal cells which are neurosecretory cells and producing hormone are attached like this okay so what is this this is hypothalamus this is posterior pituitary and these are neurosecretory cells what are neurosecretory cells guys these are cells which are particularly neurons but now they know how to secrete a hormone so hormone which is adh will be secreted by the hypothalamus and it will be it will come down from these neurosecretory cells and it will be stored in the posterior pituitary okay and the name of the posterior pituitary or the another name of posterior pituitary is neurohypophysis so let me write this also Posterior pituitary is another name is neurohypophysis. 
neuro hypophysis so what happened here guys the hormone will be produced by hypothalamus but it will come down here in the posterior pituitary and it will be stored here so what happen whenever in your body there is a water shortage condition so imagine there is a water shortage condition so during water shortage condition what happen your blood volume changes blood volume decreases or we can say the ionic concentration it uh, changes we can say there is loss of water so salt concentration will be increase now the blood goes to hypothalamus blood goes to hypothalamus because every organ gets the blood okay but in the hypothalamus certain receptors are present known as osmoreceptors what are they osmoreceptor these osmoreceptors will judge the concentration of the ions inside your blood okay so now blood volume decreases blood goes to hypothalamus in the hypothalamus guys in the hypothalamus osmoreceptors are present osmoreceptors will get stimulated because there is more ions now positive means osmoreceptors stimulated now what will happen it will tell the posterior pituitary now you need to secrete adh now adh is secreted once the adh is secreted what it will do so hypothalamus particularly do two functions first adh it will secrete adh also it will also promote thirst so that you will drink more water okay now adh is secreted now adh what it will do first it will go to later parts or distal parts of tubule like dct and collecting tubule it will go to the later or distal parts of nephron and it will ask them to reabsorb water to reabsorb nacl and water as a result it will prevent loss of water or it will prevent diuresis okay this is what it do second thing that i have already told you it will cause vasoconstriction so once it will uh, causes vasoconstriction there will be increase in blood pressure and hence there will be increase in gfr this is how it prevents the loss of water okay let's read ncrt guys because that's really important the function of kidney is efficiently monitored and regulated by hormonal feedback mechanism involving the hypothalamus jg and to a certain extent the heart osmoreceptors in the body are activated by change in blood volume body fluid volume and ionic concentration all same blood volume body fluid volume means in the body entire fluid has been gone down the ionic concentration has been changed the ions have been increased okay an excessive loss of fluid from the body can activate these receptor which stimulate the hypothalamus to release anti diuretic hormone of vasopressin as we have done that these osmoreceptors will be stimulated then adh will be secreted from the or it will be released from the posterior pituitary on the stimulation of hypothalamus now adh um ADH facilitates water reabsorption from later part of the tubule what ADH will do it will lead to the reabsorption of NaCl in water both they have not mentioned NaCl but yes ADH also lead to the reabsorption of NaCl but the major purpose is again the water thereby preventing diuresis an increase in body fluid volume can switch off the receptor and suppress the ADH release complete the feedback now why it is a feedback loop once it will prevent diuresis the blood volume will change and hence if the blood volume change these osmoreceptors which are stimulated they will be switched off once they're switched off then adh will not be secreted so it's like a feedback loop okay how the water decreases in your body it will stimulate the osmoreceptors osmoreceptor causes adh secretion adh what it will do it will pre uh, prevent water loss then there will be increase in water in body and once it is there is increase in water it will give negative feedback to the osmoreceptor and osmoreceptors will switch off so we say that it's like a feedback loop you call it as feedback loop okay guys so the feedback loop is very much essential here all right next ADH can also affect the kidney function by constrictory effect on the blood vessel what is a constrictory effect on the blood vessel you also call it as vasoconstriction vaso word is always used for blood vessels guys 
This cause an increase in blood pressure and increase in blood pressure can increase the glomerular blood flow and hence the GFR. This is what we have done till now. Let's talk about the another mechanism and that is your Brennan angiotensin mechanism. All right. Okay, move further, which is RAS. What's the full form of RAS? Renin angiotensin aldosterone system. So, to understand this system, you need to understand uh, what is juxtaglomerular apparatus. Let's get started. So, what is juxtaglomerular apparatus? Juxta. Wherever the word juxta comes, na, that means, uh, okay, let me tell you, wherever the word juxta is written, that's always meaning is this, that means something is present just near to some another thing, okay, the position is always like that, okay, so juxta glomerular apparatus, again, some things are present towards each other, that's why their nature is changed, imagine this is a Bowman's capsule, and here you have a front arteriole. What arteriole? Okay. A front. A front which brings blood. A front which take away blood. And a front is always broader than the a front. Near to this is present DCT. Now you must be wondering, ma'am, DCT was present away. Imagine this is Bowman's capsule, then there will be PCT, lubopenia, and so. And DCT is present just like that. Whatever diagram we make is the you know open end of the nephron but you know there are million of nephron and they are present very congested to each other as a result the bowman's capsule is present near the dct so this is your bowman's capsule and this is your dct now due to their proximity they have with time uh, or we can say in our body what uh, evolution has taken place here? The DCT cells are specialized, have become specialized, which are present in front of the afferent arteriole. Now, afferent cells are also specialized, which are present in front of the DCT. Okay. So, for example, if I say there are certain cells which are very densely packed present in the DCT, they are known as macular denser cell. Similarly, there are certain cells, they are very specialized cells present in the afferent arteriole. These are juxta glomerular cells. What are these? Juxta glomerular cells. Okay, and what are these? Macula denser cells. Macula denser cells. So, juxta glomerular cells, they secrete renin. They secrete renin and erythropoietin. Erythropoietin has nothing to do with the kidney function. The function of erythropoietin is to increase erythropoiesis. What is erythropoiesis? Formation of RBCs that we have done in the previous chapter. Okay. What is erythropoiesis? Poiesis means synthesis. So, what synthesis? Erythro. Erythro means RBC. Formation of RBCs. Okay. And renin is the one which helps in regulation. All right, guys. So, how does the regulation take place? We need to understand this in detail. Now, what happened? When the GFR drops, what drops GFR? Imagine due to certain reason, the GFR goes down. If the GFR goes down, what will happen next? There will be less or low formation of filtrate. Low formation of filtrate. This will be detected by macula densa cells. Or macula densa cells, they will get stimulated. Once they get stimulated, what are macular denser cells? The cells of the DCT. Now, once they are stimulated, they will stimulate JG cells. They will stimulate JG cells. What are JG cells? Now, you all know juxta glomerular cells. I am just writing the short form. Okay. Now, after the JG cells are stimulated, they will secrete renin. Now, this is a renin with single N. This is a renin with single N. Now, what renin will do? You have one protein which is angiotensinogen. Angiotensinogen is a protein that comes from liver. So, this is how we say the liver plays a very important role in osmoregulation. This angiotensinogen will be converted into angiotensin 1. Now, who will convert it? Might be you have guessed it. If you have guessed it, then it is renin. Okay, I hope your guess is right. <laughs> now, angiotensin 1 will be converted by ACE into angiotensin 2. 
what is ace angiotensin converting enzyme it comes from lungs see how how beautiful this is na entire body is uh, you know working together towards a common goal so good so what is ace angiotensin converting enzyme angiotensin converting enzyme okay this is what it is now angiotensin 2 what it will do first of all it will cause vasoconstriction if the vasoconstriction occurs you also know what will happen blood pressure increases and the decreased gfr will be increased this is what regulation is whatever things are gone wrong just in just you know uh, regulate it all right second thing it will go to the pct and it will ask pct for nacl and water reabsorption and third most important it will go to a gland known as adrenal gland and in adrenal gland we have a we have two portion one is cortex another is medulla we'll be discussing this gland in detail in the chemical control and coordination chapter okay or chemical integration and coordination so now adrenal gland will secrete aldosterone aldosterone is particularly a hormone and this aldosterone has a function that it will go to the dct and ask the dct to reabsorb any and water this is always say conditional reabsorption takes place in dct because once aldosterone will bind to it only then it will cause the reabsorption of any and water okay so here reabsorption of sodium ions and water now most of you get confused here let me just uh, break those uh, confusion barriers here about dct aldosterone will also always cause the reabsorption of na positive and water adh will cause the reabsorption of nacl and water particularly the water whereas the angiotensin 2 can also ask the pct for nacl and water okay but aldosterone to the dct it will always reabsorb any positive and water this is what conditional reabsorption is the very most common question that is asked which of the following has a constrictory you know effect so angiotensin 2 do have a vasoconstrictory effect okay this is how the uh, you know the regulation takes place with the help of ras let's uh, read this one the jg plays a complex regulatory role you all know it's, it's quite complex <laughs> a fall in glomerular blood flow glomerular blood pressure or gfr can activate the jg cell to release renin which converts angiotensinogen in blood to angiotensin 1 and further to angiotensin 2 so they have told you in one line the mechanism up to this one okay up to this one so up to this one they have uh, explained the entire mechanism in one go okay so what they have said if there is fall in gfr jg cell will be stimulated they will secrete renin which will convert angiotensinogen into one and then into the two by ac okay then now what angiotensin 2 do Angiotensin 2 also activates the adrenal cortex to release aldosterone. Aldosterone causes reabsorption of sodium ion and water from the distal part of the tubule. Distal means they're talking about DCT. This also lead to an increase in blood pressure and GFR because it has vasoconstriction effect. This complex mechanism is generally known as renin angiotensin mechanism. Okay, all right. I think everyone is good to go here. Okay, you must mention here reabsorption of sodium ion and water in DCT or distal tubules. Otherwise, you'll get confused. you know sometimes you listen things and then you forget but the things that are written in the notes they are always you always remember that that's why i always say make your own notes these are the notes of diksha ma'am what are your notes it's the you know uh, combination of what i am writing plus what are you understanding for example if you understand a thing and you start writing that uh, in your language for example if i said you know this this is what happened you know some kind of students have a habit to write everything what a teacher says and they will never forget things so always always have a good notes make make a habit to make good notes guys and this will go long way for you okay all right anyways let's talk about the another type of mechanism here that is the role of anf anf's full form is atria natriuretic factor so here comes the role of heart this is secreted by this is basically a peptide chemical it is what it's a peptide peptide are what these are the chains of amino acid okay they are secreted by atrial 
walls of the heart. You know what is atria? I know you all know because I have taught you the structure of heart. So atrial wall secretes this hormone. So once the atrial wall secretes this hormone, now what it will do? And what stimulates its secretion? What stimulates its secretion? Whenever there is increase in blood flow, imagine there is blood flow, increase in blood flow. The blood pressure will be sensed by the walls of atria. You all know that, right? So there will be secretion of ANF secretion of ANF. Once ANF is secreted, first of all, it will do vasodilation. Guys, whenever there is vasoconstriction, that will always increase the blood pressure and, and it will increase the GFR. Opposite to that, if the vasodilation occurs, what will happen? There will be fall in the blood pressure and hence fall in the GFR. Okay. Second thing it does, it, it is a check to RAS or we can say it inhibits it inhibits ADH and RAS system, renin, angiotensin, aldosterone system because it inhibits particularly in RAS, what does it inhibits? It inhibits renin, it inhibits renin, okay. This is how this ANF is working opposite to both and this will lead to the water, this will lead to the water, yes, shortage condition or uh, it will conserve water. It will lead to the shortage of water or we can say it will uh, causes dehydration in your body. There will be more water loss. So ANF is responsible for water loss. All right. Do not forget this. I tell you, do not forget this. All right. So let's move further and have some uh, this question. But before that, let's study or uh, let's see what urine contains. So the product that we have formed is urine, it's four time concentrated if there is a juxtaglomerular apparatus or uh, what you say the juxtamedullary nephrons are also involved, okay. Now what is the color of the urine? It is pale yellow in color. It is pale yellow in color, it is transparent and it is clear. That means there are no some particles present. The pH is 6 so we call it as acidic. It is slightly acidic in nature. Rest, the things, they depend upon uh, what type of a food you eat. For example, if you feed on a lot of vegetables, your uh, pH of the urine will be more uh, alkaline. But if you feed more on the fruits, they are acidic in nature. Your pH will be changed. Your urine pH will be more acidic. Now, what is present inside the urine? 96% is still the water. Out of 4%, 2 percent is urea. We excrete around 28 to 30 grams of urea per day. Yes, per day we excrete 28 to 30 gram of urea and rest 2 percent are other substances like it can be uric acid, it can be creatinine or other based or other substances. Okay, so this is what you excrete in the urine every day. Sometimes you feed on certain substances that causes diuresis. Diuresis means dilute urine. Now what are the substances that, foster, that forms the dilute urine? You call them as diuretic substances. Okay. For example, sometimes you feel, especially uh, just leave with the winter conditions, Whenever, especially oh, you have a lot of tea or a cup of coffee, more than two cup of uh, coffee in a day, you usually feel that you are urinating more. Why? Because coffee is a diuretic substance. So in diuretic substance, we have like coffee, we have tea, we have alcohol. All these will le lead to the water loss in the body. That's why after alcohol, uh, people feel dehydrated and they're advised to have lemon water. Right? Why? Because the body is dehydrated. So we need to have certain substances that will restore the water. Okay? So diuretic substances are those which will form the dilute urine. And this is what is present inside your urine. Why the color is yellow? The yellow is due to a pigment known as urochrome pigment. So this pigment gives your urine a yellow color. Okay? Alright, now let's solve the questions guys. Okay? An adult human excrete on an average dash liters of urine per day that we have already discussed in the uh, formation of urine also 1 to 1.5 liter per day. Next, 
on an average dash gram of urea is excreted out per day that's nearly 25 to 30 gram or we can also say 28 to 30 the you know these things really uh, differ from a person to person in fact it is different in male and female also okay all right next the gradient across the medullary is made caused by NaCl, urea, glucose, both 1 and 2. Very simple, straightforward question. The gradient is maintained by two components, NaCl and urea. So, answer will be 4, 1 and 2. So, those who do not read all the options, they must have marked 1, right? But don't you dare to do this in the exam, okay? <laughs> all right, next. Find the incorrect statement. Now, that's the one, good one. ANF mechanism act as a check on renin angiotensin mechanism. This is true. ANF inhibits renin and hence it's a check on it. Angiotensin 2 being a powerful vasodilator increases the glomerular blood pressure and thereby GFR. Just one word difference, dilator. No, it's a powerful vasoconstrictor. Okay, so this is incorrect. So answer is 2. Let's see whether others are right or wrong. ADH facilitate water reabsorption from later parts of the tubule preventing diuresis. True. Aldosterone causes reabsorption of Na positive and water from distal part. This is also true. So, answer is 2. Human kidney can produce urine nearly dash time concentrated than the initial filtrate formed. How much is that osmolarity? From 300 to 1200, how much times? 4 time concentrated. So, we make 4 time concentrated urine or we can make depending upon the condition 4 time concentrated urine. Okay, next. A fall in the GFR activates. So, whenever your GFR is less, what will be activated? Whenever you have less GFR. Whenever you have less GFR, first of all, change in the GFR can activate two things. One, RAS or you can say change in the GFR can activate only two mechanisms. ADH has nothing to do with the GFR. Okay. Second, whenever there is increase in GFR, what will be released? ANF. Okay, because here the blood pressure has been decreased and here the blood pressure has been increased. So, fall in the GFR always stimulate juxtaglomerular cell to release the renin. Not renal cortex, not adrenal medulla, not posterior pituitary. This is the ADH mechanism. Adrenal cortex uh, uh, is stimulated by angiotensin 2, not by the GFR. By GFR, what is affected? JG cells are affected. So, answer to this question is 1. Okay, next. Which of the following does not favor the formation of large quantities of dilute urine? That means this one will prevent diuresis. Okay, this one will prevent diuresis. Or this one is not in favor of producing dilute urine. This one is not in the favor of water loss. This one is not in the favor of water loss. ANF causes water loss because it affects the renin. Alcohol and caffeine, they are diuretic, so they will also cause water loss, whereas renin will conserve water. Answer is 4. Okay, next. Role of the other organs in excretion. Now, what is the role of other organs of your body in excretion? Let's take that now. So let's talk about the role of other organs in excretion. Yes, so in the starting we have done there are two types of organ, primary and secondary. In primary we have one uh, pair of kidney and the, in the secondary one we have some other organs. Let's talk about them. So first of all we have our skin which is also acting as a secondary excretory organ. Then we have guys lungs, we have liver, we have large intestine. And we also have one gland, which is the library gland. And that's the salivary gland. Now, what are uh, and how are they contributing in excretion? And what are they uh, excreting? Let's talk about that now. In the skin, we have two types of gland. One is a sweat gland. And another is an oil gland. Oil gland is also known as sebaceous gland is also known as sebaceous gland. So yes, they do excrete a lot of substances. So their role in excretion can be negligible. But yes, they do perform the role of excretion. So in the sweat one, what do you excrete? You excrete, uh, 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 you excrete water, you excrete salts like NaCl and you excrete lactic acid as well. Okay. And a very few amount of urea is excreted in the sweat. In the oil, we excrete waxes sterols, fatty acid and hydrocarbons. All these are nothing but lipids. These are what? Lipids. So these are the substances that you excrete and as the 
or in the oil from your oil gland or sebaceous gland. Then we have salivary gland. It also excretes very small amount of urea. Lungs excrete CO2 and water. How much CO2? 200 ml CO2 is excreted by your lung per minute because CO2 is also your main excretory waste. How is urea formed? It is formed as a combination of CO2 and NH3 only, ammonia only, right? So this is also one of the very important excretory waste. Then liver, it excretes a lot of substances. As you know, a lot of things get detoxified in the liver. So it excretes toxins. It excretes bile pigments like bilirubin, biliverdin, right? And a lot of sterols or steroids. It also excretes cholesterol. All these substances, the drugs, they are excreted by your liver. Actually, they are excreted by the liver. It enters inside the large intestine and from large intestine, it moves out from your body. Fine. Then in the large intestine, a lot of divalent turcotines like magnesium ions, calcium ions and sometimes iron is excreted by your large intestine. Okay, so basically divalent ions, they are excreted by your large intestine. So see, these organs are also performing a very important role and generally the question can be asked like, uh, they'll give you a sentence, the salivary gland excretes small amount of urea. So you must know about that. Okay, all right. So let's talk about micturation. What is micturation? Process of urination. Before starting this topic, I will suggest everyone to go back and watch again the uh, structure of urinary bladder and then come here, resume and start the process of micturation with me. Okay, not the actual micturation, <laughs> but the topic. Okay, so here we have a urinary bladder and you all know that urinary bladder have set of muscles known as detrusor muscles. What are these detrusor muscles? Now, what happens when your urinary bladder gets filled for up to like 500 ml, or we can say sufficiently the urine is filled inside the urinary bladder, the walls of the bladder get stretched. So, when the walls of the bladder get stretched, the neurons, it has certain receptors present which have neurons. These neurons will send signal to central nervous system, especially the spinal cord. Central nervous system comprises of two areas. One is your uh, brain another is your spinal cord but micturation is uh, or micturation is a process of urination which is basically a reflex action it's basically a reflex action for example when the urinary bladder gets filled the wall gets stretched so the sensory receptors present over here will send signal to the central nervous system now the central nervous system will give its neuron and then it will ask the detrusor muscle to contract so when these detrusor muscle will contract, the urine will move downward. Okay, so it will cause first thing the, uh, uh, you know, what do you call it as contraction of detrusor muscle. Second, here are present certain bands of the muscle known as sphincters. And it will ask the sphincters, it will ask the sphincters to relax. Because when the sphincters relax, as I've told you, they're like rubber bands. So when the sphincters relax, they will expand the opening and the urine will move down. Urine will move down. So let's write it with me. First of all, what will happen? The wall of urinary bladder gets stretched. Why it gets stretched? Urine gets filled in urinary bladder. What is UB, guys? urinary bladder okay now after the wall of the urinary bladder gets stretched the signal is sent to cns right why because this urinary bladder have what these sensory receptors these urinary bladder have these sensory receptors Once the signal is sent to the CNS, then what will happen? Once the signal is sent to the CNS, then it will send signal or neurons will send signal to detrusor muscle and sphincters, which will cause detrusor muscle to contract. And sphincters relax. And sphincters relax. And then urine moves out. 
and this is how we all urinate all right okay next move further and talk about the hemodialysis now what will happen if a person's kidney got damaged you must have heard a lot of pe people's kidney got damaged and they go for artificial kidney or hemodialysis so you all must have heard of this word somewhere in your life the artificial kidney or hemodialysis if the damage, uh, if the you know, if somehow one kidney is damaged uh, and uh, other kidney can easily take over that. Sometimes, if only one kidney is left and uh, half of if, half of that kidney is also damaged, then at that particular time, a person can be asked to undergo hemodialysis. Why? Because now half kidney cannot pick up the entire uh, you know metabolic waste of uh, your entire body and excrete it. Okay. So for that, we need to go for hemodialysis, which is particularly nothing. Just the, you know, uh, another option of a kidney or we can say it's like an artificial kidney. So what happened in hemodialysis? In hemodialysis, a box-like kidney is present here, just like this. And inside that is present a tube, which is a cellophane tube. What tube? A cellophane tube. Okay, so what we do, we ask a person to give their radial artery. <laughs> okay, not giving, it's not like that donating. What we do? From the radial artery, radial artery is present on the wrist. We take blood from that radial artery of the patient. And then we cool the blood at 0 degrees Celsius. And we also add heparin. Heparin is an anticoagulant. Heparin is an anticoagulant. The entire purpose to cool the blood and to add uh, the anticoagulant is that to prevent blood clotting. Because blood have a tendency... Whenever it will come in contact with the air, the blood will eventually clot, guys. Whenever the when the blood will come in contact with the air, it will clot. But once the blood get, gets clotted, your purpose will not be fulfilled. Uh, rather than cleansing the blood, you have made it more complicated and the person can die. Because if the clot inside the blood vessels are formed, it will, you know, block the passages and person can die. Okay. So here we take blood from the radial artery and we keep it uh, at a cooler temperature and add the anticoagulant. Now blood will enter inside this tube and what's the name of the tube? The name of this tube is cellophane tube. Cellophane tube. This tube is semi-permeable. That means it will only allow the passage of certain substances. And this is dipped in a fluid. This tube is dipped in a fluid and you call it as dialyzing fluid. This is a dialyzing fluid. The concentration of dialyzing fluid is same exactly that of plasma. The only thing that we have not, uh, uh, you know, added in the dialyzing fluid is that it does not contain any waste. So its concentration is same as plasma. But no waste. Because we want, if the waste is at lower concentration in the dialysing fluid and it is high in the higher concentration in your blood, then the entire waste will move inside this dialysing fluid. This is our purpose. This is what we want to do. We want when the blood will pass through this cellophane tube, it's hollow inside. The cellophane tube is hollow inside. When the blood will pass through the cellophane tube, it will see the uh, difference in the concentration. So the entire waste will move inside the dialysing fluid because the concentration of waste is lower there. And you know things move from high concentration to low concentration. Now not everything will move because our cellophane tube is semi-permeable. It will only allow certain substances to pass through. Once the blood has been cleansed, we will add antiheparin because we don't want that blood uh, with the heparin will go inside your body because whenever if you need blood clotting, the clotting of the blood will not take place. Why? Because you have added a lot of heparin there. Okay, for example, there is a need of blood clotting. At that time, it will not occur. Then uh, your person will again can uh, uh, suffer a lot of blood loss. Now, it will uh, uh, taken back into the temperature it is formed and then it is put back into the radial vein. This is how we perform the hemodialysis. In hemodialysis, from one end, the blood is taken, passing through this artificial kidney, this entire is artificial kidney with cellophane tube and dialysing fluid. Once the blood has been cleansed, it will uh, be added with antiheparin, warmed and, uh, and it will send back to the patient's body. So this is how we do the hemodialysis. Okay, guys. Okay, now let's talk about certain other disorders related with your kidney. 
So what are the disorders we are going to talk about? First, we are going to talk about glomerulonephritis. Second thing that we are going to talk about is renal calculi. Yes. So first of all, let's talk about glomerulonephritis. It's the inflammation. Wherever the word itis is written, straight away it's an inflammation of something. And this is the inflammation of glomerulus. So if your glomerulus gets inflamed, the filtration membrane will also get inflamed. So the, in, uh, so the filtration membrane's pore size will increase. Now what happened? The filtration is ultrafiltration because the, the pores are very small and proteins cannot pass through that. But what if the glomerulus gets inflamed due to certain blood infection like bacterial infection, right? And the pore size increase. Now that protein can easily pass inside that and enter inside the filtrate and the protein will be reflected in your urine. So if a person urine sample have certain things inside the urine like protein, especially albumin or RBC or the urine color is red. That means person's filtration membrane has been inflamed due to infection and the things that were not, earl not earlier able to filtrate, they can easily pass through that and hence they are reflected in the urine. So this can lead to albuminuria, albuminuria, albuminuria means presence of albumin in urine albumin is a protein of blood right and also it can be hematuria hematuria means presence of blood in the urine so what happened when the inflammation of glomerulus occur there can be inflammation in filtration membrane also because the filtration membrane is partly made up of the capillaries only, right? It contains a simple squamous epithelium of your uh, capillaries, fine? Next is renal calculi. They are generally also known as renal stones. So what happen in renal calculi? Calcium oxalate salts are formed. Or sometimes calcium phosphate salts are formed in the kidney. But mostly calcium oxalate are formed. And these salt, they will cause a lot of pain. A small, small crystals are formed. Their stones uh, or crystals are formed. And these stones or crystals, they will cause a lot of pain. They're usually present in which region? The uh, renal pelvis region. They're generally present in the renal pelvis region. They can move down to the ureters and they can cause even the blockage. And that is really a bit of a painful. So sometimes when they are very small, they are usually, uh, the doctor asks you to have some medicines and they will come out with the urine. And uh, sometimes you, the patient has to undergo operations where they are burned with lasers or something. And this is how the stones are taken out. One more stone you have heard of are gallbladder stones. They are same kind of a stones, but uh, they basically contain more cholesterol than calcium ions. They are formed by the more of a cholesterol and hence they inflame the gallbladder. But gallbladder can be easily removed and uh, no lifestyle much of a change occurs inside a, uh, or in a person's life. And they're not much that serious. Yeah, the pain caused by them is quite serious. Okay. Anyways, guys, let's talk about more disorder. So here, first of all, we are going to talk about diabetic person. If I talk about diabetes, first let's uh, clear the fundamental of diabetes. There are two types of diabetes. One is diabetes insipidus. And another is diabetes mellitus. Both the diabetes, both the diabetes show same symptom. And what are the same, what are the symptoms? Polyuria and polydipsia. That means whether you have diabetes insipidus or whether you have diabetes mellitus, you will have excessive urination. You will go to the uh, uh, that toilet a lot for urination. And second, you will have excessive thirst. Because you are going uh, to urinate a lot, the water will be lost from your body and hence you will be more thirsty. So these are the two symptoms in both the condition, whether it is diabetes insipidus or whether it is diabetes mellitus. In case of diabetes insipidus, there is a low level of ADH or vasopressin. Okay, it has nothing to do with the glucose. It has nothing to do with the glucose. Here, the level of ADH goes down and hence you feel diuresis. That's it. 
whereas in diabetes mellitus it has a role of insulin it has a role of insulin it is concerned with the glucose metabolism so here no no relation no relation with glucose metabolism If you remember, we have done in the pancreas that pancreas uh, pancreas secrete the hormone insulin, and insulin reduces your uh, blood sugar level. Okay. Now the person who have diabetes mellitus, they have a role with glucose metabolism because here insulin plays an important role. So diabetes mellitus is of two type. One is type one, and another is type two. Okay. So, most common diabetes that occurs to patients, especially in the old age, is type 2. In type 1, it occurs from birth because it is autoimmune disorder. Guys, what are autoimmune disorders? These are disorders in which your own immunity starts killing your own body cell. Right now, my immunity knows that these are my own body cells and I will not kill it. I will only kill the foreign cell. Somehow your immunity goes bad or it fails to recognize foreign and your own body cell, it will start killing your own cell. And these are autoimmune disorder where our body's immunity are killing our cells. <clears throat> like insulin is, is secreted by beta cells of pancreas. Insulin is secreted by beta cells of the pancreas. So now these this is an autoimmune disorder. Here beta cells will be destroyed. Beta cells will be destroyed by immunity. If the beta cells are destroyed, there will be no insulin. And hence, a person has to take shot of insulin every day. Whereas in the type 2, it occurs due to insulin resistance. For example, this is a cell. And this cell, when insulin comes to this cell this cell picks the glucose and glucose enter inside your body cell and hence in the blood glucose concentration decreases this is what insulin does what does insulin do from blood it will send glucose inside your body cells so for that we need insulin now what if your cells are resistant to the insulin so insulin resistance of cells occurs and even if you increase the concentration of insulin only then, uh, sorry, if you increase the concentration of insulin only then they will work. In the low concentration they will not work at all. Okay. So here in the normal concentration they will not work. In the higher concentration they will work. So it has nothing to do with the insulin. It's, it's due to because the cells have become resistant. And this occurred due to old age, due to genetics, due to obesity, lifestyle. These are the reasons of the type 2 diabetes. Now, you know about the diabetes in more detail. So, let's talk about the disorders related with the, uh, the kidneys. Okay. Now, what happened? Now, what happened if a person is uh, having diabetes? Which diabetes? I'm talking about mellitus. So, the problem that a diabetes mellitus person face is the glucose is not picked up by your body cells. Your body cell cannot pick up your glucose. So the blood glucose level increases in diabetes mellitus. There is increase in blood glucose. Okay. So our uh, blood or you can say our body has a fixed concentration of every molecule in our body. Okay. Or we can say in our blood everything is present in a fixed concentration. For example, if I say the concentration of the glucose in the blood can be 4.5 to 5 millimolar. Okay. If it exceeds this one, if it increases this one, or if I say the concentration of the blood uh, glucose is generally 180 milligram per 100 ml of blood. Okay, this should be your uh, blood glucose after eating the food. If it exceeds 180, then what will happen? If the blood glucose increases, the glucose is filtered out by kidneys. Glucose is filtered by kidneys in urine so this condition is known as glycosuria or glucosuria presence of glucosuria what is glycosuria glucosuria presence of glucose in urine 
so this is usually seen in the case of diabetic mellitus person that their blood sugar when it, when it increases the kidney will filter it out and it will reflect in the urine and you call it you call it as glucosuria now because the person who is diabetic mellitus it is not storing the glucose inside the uh, cells that means there is no formation of glycogen generally what happen in our cells when your insulin is there and your cells is working properly fine, uh, finally the glucose will go inside the, the cell and lot of glucose will form glycogen and glycogen is a source of energy and glycogen is a source of energy but in this condition if a person is not uh, able to pr uh, produce the glycogen inside the cell in this condition what will happen your glycogen is not present glycogen is not present the body will burn fat body will burn fat and whenever there is fat oxidation fat always oxidize halfly or partially fat cannot undergo complete oxidation like that of glucose it always undergo half oxidation and then it will form ketonuria or ketone bodies are formed whenever the glucose gets oxidized it will it will form uh, co2 and water but whenever the fat gets oxidized it is not able to completely oxidize because it has double bonds so here ketone bodies are formed and these ketone bodies are reflected in urine and you call it as ketonuria so these two symptoms ketonuria and glucosuria these two are the symptoms of a person who is diabetic who is diabetic right also these kind of a symptoms are seen in pregnant female so pregnant female can also show these symptoms of uh, glucosuria and ketonuria okay so that's about the disorders guys let's uh, solve some questions malfunctioning of kidneys can lead to accumulation of urea in the blood a condition called now here the another disorder that i'm going to discuss with you you have studied about glucosuria and ketonuria and diabetes what about uremia whenever you have kidney damage whenever you have kidney damage at this point when you have kidney damage what you can do okay for example a person have kidney damage what person can do first first a person can undergo hemodialysis okay if there is more damage the person can go for kidney transplant in kidney transplant it is very tough because you know you have to find the kidney the donor then match it if it is match or not that's a question again and you also sometimes you know your body does not accept the kidney because it's a foreign and that's a lots of problem right now what will happen if a person's kidney is damaged at that time urea will not be excreted urea not excreted urea cannot get excreted and hence blood urea increases blood urea level increases and this condition is known as uremia what you call it as uremia so if i'm saying someone is suffering from uremia that means the blood urea level has been increased and that can be due to kidney damage and if someone has a kidney damage how will you excrete this urea either by hemodialysis or by kidney transplant you will you will give the kidney and the kidney will function and throw the waste out okay so uremia is another disorder uremia is another disorder where if there if a person's kidney is damaged the urea will not be excreted and there will be increased concentration of urea okay all right next so the answer to this question guys will be four accumulation of urea in the blood next stone or insoluble masses of crystallized salts called oxalates formed within the kidney are seen in simple renal calculi also known as renal stones next guys amount of co2 excreted out by lungs is 200 ml per minute not liter liter are too much yaar. okay you just use your iq at this point liter is too much how are the lungs can uh, release liters of gas in minute then there will be a lot of sound oh, like that yeah okay then sebaceous glands excrete sterol hydrocarbons waxes all of these you know that right all of these next Glycosuria and ketonuria are absorbed in or observed in, not in the insipidus. It has nothing to do with the glucose metabolism in the case of diabetes mellitus. 
so guys you have to see in diabetes insipidus it has nothing to do with the glucose its only concern is the dilute urine and that's due to adh deficiency all right so that's it about the entire chapter so i have made you read ncrt of only the important topics if you have seen so in the previous lecture my only purpose to make you read the entire ncrt in the body fluids is to tell you that how to read the ncrt and how to you know attend these lecture always read one topic with me understand it open your ncrt read it mark it right this is the way how to read the ncrt i have made you uh, uh, read all the important uh, paragraphs because i know there you get stuck sometimes and i don't want my students to get stuck in any topic when i am here and i am alive right <laughs> all right guys so that's all about excretion and uh, excrete products and elimination i hope you have enjoyed this lecture as well i have read a lot of comments in the body fluids and thank you so much lots of love guys and you are loving it too and uh, just keep on uh, reading and uh, keep on studying things do not get demotivated there is nothing like that and um, you know just stay with me stay uh, with the schedule that we are giving you and definitely everything will be easy as i say easy peasy lemon squeezy <laughs> all right so this was diksha ma'am your zoology teacher i'll meet you in the next class we'll study locomotion and movement till then just complete it up bye bye take care